I'm very excited to introduce our speaker today, Mr. Tom Wild. Tom grew up in the Tidewater area. He, his previous career was in geology, working for 25 years for Chevron, specializing in downhole technology, interpretation, research, and teaching. He and his wife moved to Charlottesville in 2008 where he has worked as a consultant for oil, environmental firms, and the U.S. Geologic Survey. Today, he is fully retired and involved with numerous nature organizations, including uh, Ivy Creek and the chapter, uh, uh, the Virginia chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation. And he's currently serving as their president. And we are very excited to learn from him all about what is happening with the American Chestnut. So without further ado, um, Mr. Tom Wild. Okay, first a correction. I am not currently the president. I am currently the secretary. John Scrivani, who is John Scrivani, who is also on here, is currently the president. So just that little clarification. Um, all right, let me see. Let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, where'd it go? There it is. All right. Can everybody see that? Yes. That's working. Okay, good. All right. So um, for the talk today, I'm going to cover Boy, a, a lot of topics. There's a lot going on with this, uh, with this effort and with this tree. I'm going to start with a little bit of history, um, and I'm going to talk about different restoration strategies, and um, then I'm going to talk about what's working, what's not, and what we hope is going to be going on in the future. So that's kind of my plan. Um, I'm trying to. Have, I assume many of you have heard some of the story of the American chestnut, so I'm not going to spend tons of time on the history part, but um, I'll double check when I finish up there and make sure that uh, if there are any questions about that, I can get those answered before we move on. Um, the American chestnut um, was a East Coast tree. This item here shows the, uh, here, let me get a laser pointer, excuse me. This shows the range of the, the original range of the American chestnut tree. Um, in the dark green is where it was quite prominent and in the lighter green was uh, more of its extended range. Um, so you can see we're, we're sort of right in between, um, depending on whether we're on, on, the hills, on the hillside or whether you're uh, more to the east. Um, it was a pretty common tree in this area and it extends all the way from Maine, even up into Canada, um, down into Georgia. And there are even a few examples of chestnut trees that probably were down in Florida. Um, just to give you an idea of how prominent this tree used, used to be, um, I uh, often give, have given this talk and there's almost always someone, um, an older person in the audience who's in their eighties or so, and will come up to me and tell me that as a child, they remember looking up in the mountains and seeing what they called snow in summer or snow in June. Um, this is a picture up in Shenandoah National Park um, near Stony Man, right near the Big Meadows area. And all these trees, this is from 1912. Um, and all these trees that have sort of this whitish haze to them these are American chestnut trees. And if we zoom in on an area like that, it probably looked something like this. Uh, this is a little cheating. This is obviously a modern photo and I'm not 100% sure it's an American chestnut. But when these things flower, um, especially when the flowers are quite new, they're quite white. Uh, and so it can all look like a, a snow covered area. So I suspect they were very popular, very common. And you could look up in the, in the mountains in mid-June and see what looked like snowfall. Um, they were also common in the Piedmont. 
um, and in our area. Um, and to bring it a little closer to home, these are actually some pictures from Ivy Creek. Um, there is there are numerous signs of chestnut stumps um, around um, Ivy Creek in Tom Deeroff's report from 2015, where he did a forest um, survey and forest study. Um, he references nine or 10 different chestnut stumps. Here's a picture of one of them from his report. So this would have been a tree that the cars and greers knew about. They would have known about chestnuts um, for the wood properties and also for feeding livestock and for eating chestnuts themselves. Um, there's actually also a living uh, American chestnut. This is out on the peninsula. It's a small seedling, um, but it's still out there. And if you're really interested in where it is, uh, I think we got this location from Mary Lee Epps and I'm sure she can point you to it. Um, there's also a few hybrid trees that have been planted um, at, uh, at um, Ivy Creek and we can talk about those in just a little bit. So a little bit about the American chestnut. Um, it's from the family Fagaceae, which means closely related to oaks and beech trees. Um, it's in that same um, family. It was a pretty abundant tree, or at least locally, I won't say all across its range, it was this high, but there were certainly areas where it, where it made up a significant part of the canopy. It would have taken the place of probably oaks, um, in its day, it's a tall tree, um, can get up to um, 75 or 100 feet. It's fast growing, so it probably would have competed well with a tulip tree um, in the right environment. Um, they can be quite large uh, in diameter. And other things of note, the mast, the amount of nuts that they, they can produce is quite, quite amazing. Um, very high in protein, very high in carbs. So it would have been a very important uh, wildlife tree. It was also a very important tree for um, early settlers. Um, the lumber is outstanding. It's a fast growing tree. It's extremely rot resistant and it's quite light. Um, this is what it, some of the parts of the tree look like if you haven't really taken notice of it. Um, the, the leaves are quite spectacular. They're quite large. Um, they have this toothed um, arrangement. Um, and uh, when they, 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 like I said, they get quite large. These are the, the growth habit of the tree, often has a very thick trunk and can have quite a regular spreading um, canopy. Uh, these are the flowers. This is both flowers on it. These small little flowers here are the female flower. And these are the large uh, male catkins, much like oak trees. And then this is what everybody knows a chestnut for, is the burrs, which is that encasing structure with those needles, and the nuts inside. And the American chestnut um, almost always has three nuts to a burr. As I said, it was an important timber tree. Um, one of the things that makes it so significant, as I said, it's rot resistant and very light, but it's also incredibly easy to split. And this is what you hear when people talk about split rail fences. These were almost always chestnut trees because they were very easy to split. The, the fibers are very linear and very long. Um, it was often called a cradle to grave tree because you did everything with it from, from building a cradle to your, to your coffin but it was also used for shingles, fences, flooring, siding, any kind of uh, structure where you needed big flat, long flat sheets. Um, this was a great tree for that purpose. It was also a cultural thing. Um, uh, obviously you know about chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Here's a vendor roasting chestnuts on the street. People used to write songs about it, and it was something people did. They went out and harvested chestnuts. Um, this one always, this is a, a, a wood carving here from, uh, uh, from uh, Philadelphia. I know this park, Fair, Fairmont Park in downtown Philly, and it's quite amazing to me that it had large chestnut trees and everybody went out and, harp and picked chestnuts in the fall. But it was a, it was a thing to do. 
Uh, I also said this is an important uh, tree for wildlife and for livestock. So farmers would have known about chestnut trees and often um, uh, feed chestnuts to, uh, to themselves and to their livestock, but is an enormously important tree for wildlife as well. You can well imagine um, uh, bear, uh, obvious bears and squirrels, but all kinds of birds fed on chestnuts as well. It was, it was apparently a uh, important um, food source for the passenger pigeon when it was around. And then came the chestnut blight, Cryphonectria parasitica. Um, it was first described or identified, however you want to put it, in 1904 in New York which, at the Botanical Gardens there, which is now the Bronx Zoo. Um, and it's kind of hard to imagine that's really the first occurrence of it because importing plants from the Orient was a common thing to do um, from the late 1800s on, but this is where it first was really identified and noticed. Um, it has, it presents itself as girdling cankers on the tree. Um, and it, the, the good thing is that it attacks the bark and not the roots. Um, no, well, that's, I'll say that's a good thing. We'll talk about that in a minute. It spread quickly. Um, it functionally wiped out the chestnut as an overstory tree by the 1950s. And it's, it, we lost, uh, depending on how you estimate it, probably billions of trees um, between that, in that 50 year time span. Um, one model sort of shows the initial infestation as it's called, as I said, it probably came at, from more than one place. This is probably not the only place it started, but it did start sooner in the north and march its way south. So in our part of Virginia, these trees were dying um, in the 1920s and 1930s and were essentially gone by 1950s. Here are some rather horrifying uh, pictures from stands up in Shenandoah National Park, showing you areas where chestnut was predominant and essentially looks like a uh, like Agent Orange went through here and wiped this out. So there were numerous down trees and areas that took a long time to recover. And these were probably mostly replaced by oak um, up in this area of the park. Um, I say here, as I said, bright, the blight spread extremely quickly. And it was probably hastened by the fact that people knew it was coming. Um, they tried to isolate the blight by cutting down essentially breaks, areas where um, they cut down all the trees to try to stop the blight. Also, people who had large tracts of land with chestnut on it knew how important the lumber was. And so they probably harvested it before the blight hit their areas. So um, people probably harvested the deforestation um, due to the blight. So what's left? Well, we have a number of large trees. You can find them. I know where some are in Albemarle County. This happens to be one um, that we call the Amherst tree down in Amherst County. Um, and they survive. Uh, they're not doing well. They have the blight. They are covered in cankers um, uh, um, from, from uh, fighting this off. Um, but there, there are still a few around. Um, also, if you go up in the mountains, go through Shenandoah National Park or walk any, any area, you will find young chestnut trees. And these are seedlings that are still sprouting from the original rootstock, from the original roots. As I said, this blight does not harm the roots. So they're still alive and new seedlings will pop up from time to time. And these trees will grow. Um, if they're very lucky, they'll grow to maybe to maturity and be able to flower, but eventually the blight will get them and they will succumb as well. But there are still many, many thousands of these trees up in the mountains. 
I, I, I love this, <laughs> this way of describing. It's, it's a common tree, but it's functionally extinct. That is to say, you can find many of them, but there aren't many mature ones. And the ones that are mature don't get to, uh, to openly pollinate and breed. And the blight is still around. The blight is still here. Uh, it lives on many species. Um, in particular, you'll find them on oak trees. This is a scarlet oak. Many people refer to this structure on, an, on a scarlet oak as a swollen butt. And this is chestnut blight, Cryphonectera parasitica on an oak tree. And this is the way the oak tree fights it off. It builds up these same kind of woody structures, these cankers, um, and, but it lives through it. So uh, not as susceptible as the American chestnut to the blight. So there are, um, there are probably nine or 10 different species of castania around the world. And the major ones I have here on this map, um, we're talking about Castania dentata, which is here in the Eastern United States. And this is the leaf of Castania dentata. But there are other sources of Castania. Um, another one you'll hear a lot about is the European chestnut, um, also called the sweet chestnut or the Spanish chestnut. That's Castania sativa. Um, the, the blight probably came from either samples of Chinese chestnut, which is Melissima, which is, this is its uh, leaf structure. It's a little thicker and a little more oval, or it came from Japanese chestnut, um, which is this thinner leaf over here. Um, these are all, um, both the Chinese and the Japanese chestnut were probably brought in to this country as ornamental trees, as was going on with many different ornamentals um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, and this is important. This, this little leaf up here is also, uh, this is uh, an Allegheny chinkapin, uh, which is also part of the Castania line. So chinkapins are also related and they also get the blight. So we lost the American chestnut um, functionally. Um, and some people might say, well, why not just grow Chinese or Japanese chestnut? Well, they're not the same kind of tree. Um, the American chestnut um, was a forest tree, a canopy tree, and also for all intents and purposes, a lumber tree for, uh, for it, from its use point of view. Um, it grew tall, um, it had a straight trunk, um, and it could compete in the forest with many of the other trees that we have here locally. The Chinese and the Japanese chestnuts are essentially orchard trees. Um, some of them take more of a, a, a forest uh, habit and can be grown that way, but um, they have been used and, and um, propagated in China more as a, an orchard tree. And for that reason, we could bring them over and you can grow them in your yard. And in many places, they grow quite big. If you've ever been out to Tufton Farms, there are two very large Chinese chestnuts right in, right at the opening, right in the parking lot of Tufton. Um, but they could not compete in the forest. And that's the the real reason why replacement, um, if you wanna grow a Chinese chestnut or you wanna grow it for the nuts, that'll work just fine. But if you want to take the, ch the chestnut and bring it back to the forest, we need a, 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 a canopy or a forest tree. Um, so Chinese chestnut is resistant to the blight. Um, the American chestnut is not, but the Chinese chestnut can't thrive in our forest. So that's a little bit about why we're talking about trying to bring back the American chestnut. So different restoration attempts and controls. Um, when the blight first hit, um, folks tried lots of different things. Um, 
obviously, if you have a, uh, a fungus that's attacking your tree, your first thought is maybe fungicides work, but apparently they have relatively little uh, effect. There is a new generation of fungicides which is being tried now, but that's still nothing we can do um, on a forest level that has to be treated tree by tree. Um, people tried cutting the, the blight out, uh, that doesn't work. Um, they tried segregating the blight by cutting out forest gaps and making barriers to it, but it's a, an airborne fungus and it found its way. Um, so that, that didn't seem to work. Um, there are a number of breeding attempts which have been tried. Um, there is, uh, people tried, uh, and some of this effort is still going on, to crossbreed the living American chestnuts to try to see if they can um, promote the blight resistance in just American chestnut alone. Other groups um, tried hybridizing the trees, um, crossing Chinese uh, and American chestnut or, ja or, or uh, Japanese and American chestnut. Um, our group has a more extensive hybrid back cross program, which I'm gonna talk about in just a minute. Um, I'll mention um, hypervirulence, and then there are some genetic methods that are being tried. And I'm gonna talk about a few of those. Um, the American Chestnut Foundation started um, some 30, 40 years ago now, um, uh, and it was started, um, a program was started by uh, Dr. Charles Burnham and a number of others. And the goal of this group is to restore the chestnut to its native range. We don't just wanna grow a resistant chestnut for the sake of doing it. We wanna be able to grow it and grow enough of them to get them back in the forest. And that involves a, a fairly complicated breeding program. And this, this, is, this involves selective breeding, which means we're going to um, not allow open pollination. We're going to select the flowers and put the pollen we want on them um, and then grow them out in orchards. And then we test them for resistance. And that's what these slides are here. We, we actually, we, we isolate the, the flowers, we pollinate them ourselves, we grow them out in orchards. Here they are growing out. Uh, many of you have been down to Fortune's Cove, which at one time looked a lot like this. And then at some point we inoculate the trees with a small amount of the fungus and we see which trees get the fungus and which do not. And if they get the fungus, then we get rid of them. And that's, uh, for some people, that's a very hard part of our process. We grow the trees, we decide which trees fight the fungus well, like this rating one and which do not. And if they look like this, we cut them down. So that's how we go through, that's our unnatural selection process. Uh, we breed the trees and we look for resistance. Um, this is kind of, many of you have seen this program. Um, where we cross the, where we do a series of what we call back crosses. We start with a hybrid tree of a Chinese and American, and then we continue to breed back in Americans. And this first um, part of the breeding program is what we call a series of back crosses, where we breed in Americans and get up to 15, 16 percent American. And then we do a number of intercrosses where we cross different lines. Um, in order to promote uh, genetic diversity. And by the time we get to this end stage, we will have planted hundreds of thousands of trees and killed just about that many too, and selected only the, the, the best trees. Um, so this is done over and over again with different lines from different parent Chinese, and then we cross many different American trees to try to promote um, uh, uh, diversity and, and avoid inbreeding. Um, and we're pretty much getting to the end stages of this process here. And you might ask, well, how well did that work? Um, 
And we're right now at the point of realizing that it did not work that well. Um, so why? When the initial breeding program was put in place, the genetics, the limited genetics that they had at the time suggested that this was, that um, resistance was conferred by two or three genes in the genetic makeup of the chestnut. And what we're coming to find out now is that it's probably a lot more than that. And so the original program with the number of trees that had to be crossed um, was sort of based on that three gene model. And now that we find that it's a lot more than that, we're finding that we are not conveying enough resistance um, to do what we wanna do. Um, here's a graph, just a simple cartoon showing American genes versus resistance. And this yellow bar here is like an American chestnut population. And this is a Chinese chestnut population. And our hybrid, you know, 50-50 cross would be somewhere in here. And our population of trees is something like this red cloud. Well, that's not very good. That means that the more resistance I have, the more Chinese the tree looks. And I said, I wanted an American looking tree if I wanna be able to put it in the forest. Our goal was to breed it, breed resistance in, but not have a lot of Chinese traits. And this is where we wanted to be. And this is sort of where we are right now. So not as much resistance as we had hoped for. And also the more resistance, the more the Chinese, more Chinesey the tree looks, that's not where we wanted to be. So as a result, our, in our population, we have way fewer trees that have the resistance that we wanted to have. So from that point of view, um, we have a lot of trees. Some of them are quite resistant, but we can't let them continue to pollinate each other and continue on because we're not getting the direction we want to get, which is more American and more resistance. So we have embarked in the last um, year and moving forward with a program we've sort of are leaving this uh, back cross program and moving to something we're calling best on best, which is to now that we have some genetic um, testing capability to see what kinds of genes we have in our plants, um, we are trying to isolate the trees that have the best resistance and the most American character. And we're just gonna work on breeding those and not worry so much about the diversity. We can handle that later, but we need to find and breed an American looking tree that has some resistance. So that's, that's where our focus is now on what we call best on best. And here, the sources of the trees we may be looking for are what we call LSAs, large surviving Americans, we may take the best trees out of our breeding program and not move that forward in the way we were going to. And we have other sources, um, uh, things that come from the other organization, the ACCF, which is the American Chestnut Cooperatives Foundation. Um, I said they were working on breeding just American trees. We may work with their, their um, uh, trees. Um, the forestry department has also been working um, on a breeding program. I'll talk about that here in just a second. Just a little bit about the Virginia chapter. Um, the Virginia chapter is one of 16 different um, chapters for the American Chestnut Foundation. They're mostly states or pairs of states. Um, ours was started in 2006. And these are some of the the main um, activities that will star here is Charlottesville. Um, and you can see we have orchards all up and down the Appalachians here. Um, uh, many of you have been out to Fortune's Cove, which is a really important orchard for us, although it doesn't have very many trees at the moment. Um, uh, our chapter office is down here at the uh, Rockfish Gap Community Center. Um, we have a number of orchards uh, up north. 
um, including our what was what was to be our final stage orchards at Blandy, which is the uh, State Arboretum, uh, Sky Meadows, and Banshee Reeks, which are uh, 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 state forests. Um, uh, the other, also around town, there's Middle Mountain and Freed Farm. These are these are close to town, out near Whitehall. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about a resource we have, which is uh, really quite remarkable, which is called Lisen State Forest. If you've not been out there, um, Lisen is a about 400 acres that's been tamed by the Virginia Department of Forestry, and these, this orchard was started, orchard forest, uh, however you want to categorize it, was started. Um, uh, the land was donated um, for the purpose of uh, 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 maintaining the chestnut uh, breeding strategy. And a lot of these trees were brought down from uh, an agricultural experimentation, experimental station up in Connecticut. And those trees were planted, and this was um, in the in the seventies. And some of those trees are quite large now, but forestry has maintained the original stand and used some of the seeds from that to do some of their own crossing. So there is, um, it's not exactly this. It's more open pollinated than the uh, trees we have used in the in the American Chestnut Foundation breeding program. But there are some spectacular trees down here, which look quite American, um, and some of which have a, a lot of resistance. And this is a, a state forest, so if you ever get the opportunity, um, it's not very far from uh, Devil's Backbone Brewery. Um, if you ever get the opportunity to go down there, especially in middle June, I'd encourage you to do this, because this is a, a really spectacular place to see what chestnuts um, in the wild might have looked like there are some uh, some really nice trees here. Um, that sort of takes me to where the American Chestnut Foundation is in its overall strategy. Um, they they refer to their overall strategy as the three burr strategy, which involves breeding, which is what we've been talking about, biocontrol, which I'm going to mention here, and biotechnology, which is essentially the genetic program that's going on. I'm going to mention this. I'm not going to, I'm just going to do one slide on this, just so you've heard the term. Um, this is um, an interesting feature um, or an interesting um, method for controlling the blight. It is referred to as hypovirulence. The blight is a, as I said, was a fungus, and fungus can be infected by other things, including viruses. Um, just like we can be infected by viruses, and we all know about viruses these days. Um, this is, there are viruses that will infect Cryphonectria, and if they are infected, it slows down and hinders the growth of that fungus and gives the tree a chance to survive. Um, Unfortunately, it has to be applied to the tree. So this is probably not an overall um, cure that we can treat on a forest basis. But um, here's an example of a uh, chestnut tree that's been infected with chestnut blight. And here's an example of another tree where that blight has been treated with a Cryphonectria strain that's been infected with a virus. And the virus slows the, the growth of the Cryphonectria down to the point where the tree can heal over. Um, another difficulty with using this technique is we have lots of strains of the blight here in the United States. Um, that means you'd have to create variants of the virus, just like we're hearing about in the news, that match each of those uh, Cryphonectria strains. And so that makes this a fairly complicated technique to use, although it does seem to work well. A place where they do use this and you um, 
is in Europe. Um, I haven't said anything about the European chestnut um, or the sweet chestnut, but um, it is very, um, very important tree there as well um, as the American chestnut was here. It's also tall, it's a forest tree. Um, and there, um, it also gets the blight and it is, and their forests have been affected, but not to the same extent that we've have here in this country. And some of that has to do with it being slightly more resistant. Um, also, many of the forests are what we would maybe call managed forests because chestnut is such an important crop. Um, they've managed to uh, maintain the trees um, and they use this technique of treating many of the trees with a hypovirulent form of the fungus. Um, and so you will find if you go across Europe, uh, uh, in, in Italy, Switzerland, Spain, France, you will find stands of chestnuts that are looked after. Um, and one of the things they use to help treat the fungus is this hypovirulent form. Now, moving a little bit on into transgenics and into the genetic things we can do, if we knew about the genetics of the tree, um, we could identify the key genes and maybe figure out how to um, uh, test or we could do genetic studies and figure out which trees have the, the best blight resistant characteristics. That's being worked on. But we yet, at this point in time, do not know exactly which genes are required for blight resistance. We're, we have some clues, but it's not well mapped out right now. It may be so complicated that we're not going to get a good picture of it, but we know it's more than two or three genes um, that are involved in conferring resistance. So that's one of the hopes that we'll be able to um, uh, get to that point, but we're not there yet in, in really mapping out what makes a tree resistant to the blight. But we are at a point where we've actually been able to do something for the tree. Um, this is a program you've probably heard about it that's been in the news a fair bit. It's been on TED Talks and things like that. Um, there is a group um, at, uh, at SUNY um, Environmental um, uh, Sciences Department, um, headed by William Powell. And he has been working on a transgenic American tree. Now, th that sounds really quite scary when you think about it. You know, do we think we use the term GMOs for gen things that are genetically modified, but this is probably the most benign form of genetic modification you can think of. Um, he has looked at the what goes on when, a, when the blight hits a tree. And one of the things that has been noted is that when blight infects the tree and the tree starts to get diseased, there is a, a buildup of oxalic acid, which is eating away at the uh, lignin and making the tree more vulnerable. And among many things they've, they've looked at, they, they know certain enzymes that might be able to control it. And one of the things that they tried is looking at what is called the OXO gene, which, is, uh, which uh, codes to an enzyme that breaks down oxalic acid. It's naturally occurring. It's widely um, used in other plants. Other plants use this mechanism, bananas, strawberries, cocoa, wheat, all of those. This chemical reaction does not do anything to hurt the fungus. It simply neutralizes the oxalic acid that it produces and lets the tree fight back or overcome the, the presence of the blight. Um, so with knowing about this chemical reaction and looking into this technique, they developed, and I say developed, I make this sound like this happened over a year or two. This has been going on for uh, 15 years up there. 
they have been working on a process to convey the OXO gene into a chestnut. And this is actually the technique they use is called mediated transformation. And it is actually a technique, well, technique, it's a process that happens in nature um, pretty regularly. Um, the many, many crops that we eat like corn, this is how um, many different traits have been added to corn over the years. There are some entirely natural um, uh, plants like sweet potatoes that have evolved by this, by this methodology. And they have made it um, uh, a little bit, uh, they have uh, found a mechanism to take use of this, make use of this. And the way they do it in the lab is they take um, an embryo from a chestnut seed and they grow, they, they are able to uh, get uh, a few cells and they grow a little culture of embryonic cells and then at some point when they have a number of them, they, they use what is called an agrobacteria. This is the same naturally, it's a soil bacteria. Um, it's responsible for the galls of, that you see on trees. It's the same bacteria. And it has the ability to take a gene um, and move it into another cell. And once that happens, then they will take these embryos and grow them out. And I don't make, mean to make this sound trivial. This took them years and years to figure out how to do this process. But from this, we can create a chestnut that carries this OXOG, something that it doesn't have right now. Um, something that is, like I said, natural, relatively naturally occurring. And the result is a tree that can fight against the blight. This is a, a, essentially a brother and sister pair, two trees, one that carries the OXO gene. Um, and here, both of these were given a small nick and the blight was in, introduced into it. The tree on the left heals over, this has the OXO gene. The tree on the right didn't have the OXO gene and eventually the blight just totally infected the whole stem. So this is the, the process that, that has been developed. One of the things that's actually very remarkable about the, uh, about the group up in SUNY is they have, uh, because this is being done as a, a more a science project and an ecology project, they have an army of people there who are uh, army of grad students looking into the ecology of the tree and they have done hundreds of different kinds of tests to see if there is any difference between their transgenic tree or the, the new tree they've developed and the original American tree and even comparing it to all other kinds of trees in the forest. They have done uh, growth tests of tadpoles that have eaten the transgenic leaves. They feed bees the, the, the pollen from the transgenic trees. They have looked at the nutritional of, of nuts. They study caterpillars that feed on those leaves. So they have done all the ecology tests that one might expect uh, that you might be interested in seeing. And consistently they have found no differences between the tree that they have inserted this gene into and the regular American chestnut tree. So um, that, that's really quite remarkable. Um, that they've gone that they've gone through this these steps. Now I will say that they're going to have to go through these steps because because this is a genetically modified tree. If this is ever going to be used in our program or any other program, um, it needs to have government uh, government approval. And this is unlike any other tree that's ever or any other plant that has ever been looked at. Um, because um, it's not for profit. It's going to be released and given away for free. Um, and, uh, and all the government agencies don't really know how to deal with that. 
Um, but these are the government agencies that are involved, the EPA, the FDA, the USDA, um, all need to approve the use of this tree so that if we are ever gonna use it in a population um, and release it, um, uh, they will have to approve it. It's currently under USDA approval uh, process. They've had an open comment period and it's still probably a year or so um, before this will be approved. Um, I, I, I always laugh whenever I see this part. Um, the EPA also has to approve for this. And according to the definitions of the EPA, even though this thing, this tree does not harm the fungus in any way, it is by their technical definition, a pesticide, because it is a substance um, which, which is intended to prevent or repel or mitigate any pest. And so in that regard, it's technically a pesticide, even though it has none of the, the properties of a pesticide. Um, how we will use this transgenic tree in the future, um, we don't know yet. Um, that will have to be up to our chapter in order to decide. We are doing some experimental crosses with this tree right now, um, but eventually we can't just use a transgenic tree. It will have to be introduced into a population and its uh, genetic diversity will have to be very well expanded in order for us, for us to use it. Um, and exactly how we'll do that, whether we cross it with American trees or whether we cross it with some of our, or the hybrids from our back cross program, um, we're not sure yet, but that's all in the planning stage. And these are sort of the things we're doing um, uh, as a group here in Virginia. We are establishing orchards to preserve American chestnuts, 100% pure American chestnuts having nothing to do with the transgenics or anything else. We just wanna preserve them because little by little, even though these trees are still sprouting in the forest, they're slowly dying away and we need to preserve their genetic diversity, if not for this program, for some other program in the future. Our traditional back cross program, we think is phasing out. We don't think it's living up to its expectations, but we hope some of these trees make it into our best on best selection breeding program. We're waiting on this possible approval for the transgenics um, and, uh, and uh, we'll use that with our regional American trees or with the best crosses. And we're also starting to do restoration trials. We're gonna have to figure out how we put this tree back in the wild. Even if we had a perfect tree, I don't think we know how to reintroduce it um, into the wild. Uh, do we plant seeds? Do we plant seedlings? Do we plant in open areas like strip mines or things like that? Or do we try to plant them in the forest where they have to compete? So all studies that are, that are ongoing. And these are just some volunteer opportunities. We love to have people come out and help us look for chestnuts. There's gonna be a big push for this um, in the late spring and early summer. We really want people who wanna go out and hike and while they're out, um, look for trees. Um, we have lots of uh, data collection um, uh, opportunities. We have lots of planting opportunities and um, Certainly there'll be chances to do um, pollination and harvesting. So all of these are things we, we'd, uh, we're gonna be doing a lot over the rest of the year. And with that, I'm gonna wrap it up because I talked a little longer than I thought um, and give people a chance to ask questions. Tom, there's yeah. some questions in the chat box. Do you? Oh, okay. Can let me see, see if I can those? find the. Let me see if I can find the chat box. Yes, I do. Okay. Just. Oh, thank you, John. John is pointing. Uh, I definitely should put uh, put on here that um, there's lots of information on our website, which is acf.org/va. Um, you can find a lot of information uh, in the, from the American Chestnut Foundation. Um, let's see. 
with the mycorrhizae networks of standing blight resistant American chestnuts be responsible for some of the resistance we see? Wow, that's a really good question. Instead of it just being all genetics. Um, boy, I might need your help, John. Um, I would say since the fungus is is an airborne fungus and has little to do with the root system, um, I would guess that that would not be the case. Um, uh, but it certainly may be a function of why some of our large surviving Americans um, have done so well. Um, I, it might be that mycorrhizae um, could play a role in how in how well they survive. I'm not sure. I'm sure the answer to that. Let's see. And someone else answer that same question. Orchards have certainly certainly some orchards do better than forest sites. It's a really interesting thing. Um, the chestnut is not the easiest tree to plant. Um, and I think that's because um, the tree is, um, is an opportunistic tree. It grows like oak trees grow, which is to say the tree gets rooted in, it grows very slow at first in the forest setting and waits for an opportunity, a, a fallen tree or a fire or something like that. And then it takes off. So its growth habit the way it grows in an orchard is not exactly the way it grows in a forest. So, um, let's see. Marjorie asked, is anyone working with crossing trees uh, oh, in Michigan that seem to have survived the blight? Um, unfortunately, even the trees in Michigan now have the blight. Um, it's taken longer to move up there, um, but, but blight has, um, has found them as well, but yes, people have been trying to cross anything that think they think might be blight resistant um, to try to bring it into the program. Let's see. Are we still looking for tracts of land to plant? Under some circumstances, right now, um, um, Probably that's not our biggest priority. Let's see. Talk. Next question. Okay, and the last question here from Carol. Is there any way to test for resistance earlier on? Oh, good question. Yes, yes, there is. Um, I didn't really talk about um, some of the leaf assays and the small stem assays. We are working on testing trees very young in their life, we refer to it as small stem assay work, where after um, a year or where while it's still in a pot, we will test the trees for blight resistance. And um, that way we don't have to grow them out for seven or eight years. Um, and so we are pre-testing a lot of trees in the pots before we plant them. Let's see. Um, and let's see, uh, even, when even when planted as saplings, deer are attracted to the saplings. Absolutely. Deer browse is probably one of our biggest challenges whenever we plant an orchard. We have to put them, not only do we have to put them in tubes, we have to put fences around them because deer, deer will nip off the tops of the trees. So deer fencing is probably our biggest I mean, most of our orchards, it's our biggest expense. Um, so yes, deer browse is truly a problem. And what do I think of Dunstan chestnuts? Well, Dunstan chestnuts are hybrid trees. Um, if you want chestnuts to eat and want to grow them in an open area, which is an, like an orchard or near your house, there's nothing wrong with Dunstan Dunstans. Um, they won't work for our purposes, which is to try to bring the tree back into the forest, um, but nothing wrong with using them, um, uh, you know, for your own purposes. They're, they're, they, they do work, they do grow nuts. 
Let's see. I think those are all the questions. Happy to entertain any others if anybody wants to unmute or. Well, Tom, I'd like to thank you for this very interesting talk today. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone that attended for spending time with us today. We hope that you enjoyed the talk and learned a lot. I definitely learned a lot and enjoyed it very much. Um, we will be sending out a survey after this talk and we would really appreciate it if you all would fill that out and give us your feedback for future Ivy Talks. As always, if you enjoyed these talks and what the Ivy Creek Foundation does for our community, please consider going to our website and becoming a donor today. And I wanna thank you all again and I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks so much.